The sound design on the film was established in a way that it was sort of comparable to how a lot of the other aspects of The Lord of the Rings came together down here in New Zealand, in that we had to create, obviously, a very high-tech, world-class sound effects studio. In effect, we had to plan out and lock down our plan two years before we actually started Soundpost. So we were able to, to basically start with the, the best technology. And so we just simply built that from the ground up. We rented a building, we hired some very good people, both New Zealanders and, and, and uh, various people from America and Australia and England. And I chose people that I knew could handle stress and who weren't going to freak out on me. And we had it covered basically with a fairly small team of people. And I think that gives a cohesiveness to the overall end result that you couldn't get any other way. I suppose the clearest instruction we got from Peter was just um, was just to make it real, you know, make it so that the audience is transported to Middle Earth. So when we first sat down and watched it with with Peter, one of the things he said is that he didn't want the watcher to really have much of a, a vocal element. The sound for him would be much more about his movement. I went out to a creek nearby the house. I was playing with the plunger in the creek, and you know, you plunge the water, and you know, you get all these weird, like, suction sounds. We were out in the, in the parking lot out here, actually, with rubber floor mats, wet rubber floor mats, f sort of um, wafting them through the air and slapping them uh, against things. So we went back and edited that sound in along with all the other plunger uh, stuff and it worked really well. The vocalization, which came sort of very late, there's a shot where it just sort of cries out for some sort of pain vocal. In the final mix, I ended up putting a, a walrus, a pitch down sort of walrus groan there. It just felt right. <laughs> The thing that becomes kind of difficult about doing orcs, as opposed to other monsters in, other, in, in any monster movie, is that they're very humanoid. The approach that we sort of ended up with was taking animals, sort of vicious attack animals, and then imitating them with our own voices. One of the things we used was uh, a pig dog. And we pitched it down, and it's actually one of the best groaning sounds. Give this crazy, squealing orc um, you know, a character that said, here I am, I'm a freak and I'm here to kill you, we would say, pig dog, get pig dog in there. When Peter came up with the idea of cockroachy Moria orcs, we were trying to figure out what in the world are we going to do? Part of their terror is about, is, is about them being just sort of overwhelming mass. And we couldn't quite figure out. We tried a few things that didn't quite work and we were sitting around having a beer one day, and there was a bottle cap lying on the counter. The team got all these bottle caps together and uh, put them onto the, actually onto the two by fours. We strapped the two by fours to our feet and we went out with cricket shoes on. And we went over to, to Stone Street, and the whole crew, it was a great day, we went over and, and just recorded ourselves just kind of scurrying around and making all these little weird little sounds. The cave troll um, is sort of a combination of, of tiger um, and walrus. I had to actually fabricate the breath out of two different animals. What I really liked as an inhale was a tiger, but the exhale wound up being a Canadian lynx. So I wound up making a, fabricating breaths, inhale, tiger, exhale, lynx, inhale, tiger, exhale, lynx. <laughs> And then he gets this one, this one moment where the cave troll realizes, basically realizes he's, he's mortal. And right at that one moment, we changed the cave troll's vocalizations completely from anything aggressive or tired to a very sad, um, mortally wounded walrus sound. <laughs> Peter
Peter's description for the Balrog was, he said, this is not a physical creature. It's basically shadow and flame. I mean, he's made out of, out of rock and lava, so he needs to have this sort of very natural, organic, rocky feel. So I thought it might be good to try to make a growl out of a rock. This just ungodly low grinding roar. So I recorded probably an hour's worth of cinder blocks scraping across a wooden floor. You can really hear that too. I mean, it's just this big sort of rocky scraping. The effects for um, Moria were recorded in these old tunnels that are built in a, in a hill overlooking Wellington. These phenomenal tunnels that just had this, uh, this reverb tail that just went on forever. The cave troll, um, we took him in there and, and played him you know, off of a laptop and through speakers allowed us to get the sound that David come up with for him in this natural environment that was very similar to the environment that he is in in the movie. So we took the vocalizations for the Moria orcs and the Balrog and the cave troll. We recorded all those things over the speaker in there. The ring rates were a tremendous challenge. One of our final screenings we had, this is after we've, we've completed the final mix, PJ turns to me and said, Well, I think we need to get on those rates. I don't think there's anything there worth saving. They're not scary. They're not chilling. They're not working. The problem is the, the, the element we like, I only have one of. So I played the element for him. And he said, oh, Fran can scream like that. And so we dragged Fran onto the Foley stage. And she stood there and she kind of took a deep breath in. <sighs> got the most spine-chilling screams I've ever heard in my life. They just about knocked me on my ass. And that wound up being a huge element in the ring rates, you know. That gives them a lot of their piercing um, body. The ring in the script is very much a character. It has a force and a presence and an energy. When I first started playing with ring sounds with Peter, we were going for an actual, more physical ring sound. And that turned into the ring having an actual voice. They would have different attitudes. To one person, it may be a seductress. To another person, it, just, it may be a, I don't know, it may be a lover, you know, or something like this. And that really changed into it being an actor who would remain the consistent voice of the ring throughout the film. Alan Howard uh, recorded voice overs that um, Philippa and Fran would write. He learned a whole bunch of phrases in black speech and he just went for it. <laughs> When we have to do ADR recording, we have to re-record the actors' voices. A lot, a lot of people don't realise that so much sound is actually replaced. And it happens all the time on movies, and, you know, our movie was no exception. What is the greatest power? Uh, we intend on, on uh, recording, re-recording the dialogue for about 98% of yeah. the film, which is a lot more than is normal, but um, we've got a whole bunch of problems that most films don't have. Because of the sheer size of the production, we sort of spread out around a series of uh, Wellington warehouses. And, <laughs> and through some unknown reason, um, um, a couple of these warehouses were actually right next door to the airport. You're recording dialogue, and then when we finally get in our hot little hands or watch it at rushes that night, you go, hmm, nice plane effect, you know, in Lord of the Rings. It's actually quite funny watching the dailies because you occasionally see the actors kind of stopping in their tracks to allow a 737 to blast off the runway, which is literally 50 feet away, and then they 
wait for the sound and they just carry on. We knew that it come time for post-production, we'd be in a studio recreating all of our dialogue. So scenes involving Agaladriel, there's quite a few shots that were shot at uh, 33 frames. It was to give it that dreamlike, floaty, not quite real, you're not quite there but you are sort of feel. So you've got slow-mo pictures but with real-time dialogue. So it's all lip sync. The actors have got to be precise in their um, delivery of that so that it's exactly in sync with their lips on screen. When we came to, to ADR it, we had those pictures sped up effectively. Things that were, things that are, and some things that have not yet come to pass to be as though it was shot at 24 four frames. We in the Galadriel is in fact tempted by the ring and does the Dark Queen moment. That was shot at 48 frames. So that's a 100% time expansion. Kate, uh, you know, Blanchett reeled off her lines at a fair clip. Roll camera. In place of the Dark Lord, you would have a queen, not dark, but beautiful and terrible as the dawn, treacherous as the sea, stronger than the foundations of the earth. All shall love me and despair! So that when it played back as a slow motion sequence, there was still cadence, rhythm, and it still had some shape in it, actually. In place of a dark lord, you would have a queen! Not dark, but beautiful and terrible as the dawn! Treacherous as the sea! Stronger than the foundations of the All of those elements put together then finally creates a soundtrack and then the sound mixes just smooth it all out, make it sound good, bring up the music or drop the music, the effects, bangs, make it loud, make it scary, make you jump in your seat, all of the things that you want to have for a good soundtrack.